Understanding Operation Alka today. And welcome to another look into the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot, as she called us to live to a higher standard every day. To not be satisfied with just a little empty religion in life as a shallow substitute of what we could have. In this series, as it continues in the coming weeks, we'll be hearing from family, friends, and others. They were all influenced by the life and message of Elizabeth Elliot. Today we wrap up a short series on going from tragedy to triumph as we have the recap of the Alka story. Maybe it all seems mysterious or worse. Our second Gateway to Joy program is called When You Don't Understand. Joining us today, veteran radio host Bob Lapine, as he talks about the death of the five missionaries who were killed, reaching out to the Alka people. And veteran Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger talks about the legacy of the five missionaries. Stay tuned for that. Right now, Gateway to Joy 191, a recap of the Alka story from Tragedy to Triumph, Part 5. You are loved with an everlasting love. That's what the Bible says. And underneath are the everlasting arms. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking with you today a little bit about some of the story that we didn't talk about in the interviews with the other four widows from Ecuador. Some of you may have read my books that deal with the story of the five men. The first one is called Through Gates of Splendor, which tells the whole story of what was called Operation Alka, how five American missionaries attempted to reach a tribe of Stone Age Indians who were then called Alcas. They are today called Waurani, and how those four, five men were speared to death, one of which was my husband, Jim Elliott. Uh, my second book was a biography of Jim Elliott called Shadow of the Almighty. And my third book tells a story that I want to tell you just a little bit about in the few minutes that we have today. My third book was called The Savage, My Kinsman. After Jim was killed, I said to the Lord, if there's anything you ever want me to do about the Alcas, I'm available, thinking that it was rather an absurd prayer to pray because, after all, I was a widow with a baby, 10 months old at the time, and it certainly didn't look as though anybody was ever going to go in where those five men had been killed. But an amazing series of circumstances, God enabled me to do just that in a way that I could never have designed or imagined. And so it turned out that in 1958, I was living in a little house with no walls and no floors and no furniture in a place called Tuano in Alca territory. My daughter Valerie was then three years old, and she was also there living in that little house with me. And next door was Rachel Saint, the sister of Nate Saint, the pilot who had been killed along with the other men. Mornings were very interesting. They would begin somewhere between 2.30 and 3 because the Alcas had the good sense to go to bed at night when they were tired. If they went to bed between 6.30 and 7, then it was reasonable that they would wake up between 2.30 and 3. One of the great advantages to Alca social life was that nobody had to get out of bed, let alone go out of the house. Everybody slept in a hammock. Everybody had houses with no walls. It was a fairly small clearing, so all the houses were close together. And as I would be lying in my hammock, usually asleep, the first thing that would waken me would be the sound of singing. And Alka songs uh, are, well, shall we say, monotonous. Two notes, some of them had three notes, and I'll give you a sampling of the kind of thing that I would very often hear in my dreams. But I'll have mercy on you. I won't sing all 70 repetitions of verse 1, and I have counted as many as 70, nor will I go on to verse 2. But that kind of thing would go on for quite a while. People would join in the singing, and everybody would be lying in their hammocks. The women would be fanning up the fires and perhaps putting the clay pot of last night's leftovers on the fire. That's usually what breakfast was. And then conversation would begin, and conversations would be relayed around the clearing if anyone had missed out on anything. But when I finally opened my blue eyes, which to the Alcas were the strangest eyes they had ever seen, 
they told me they looked like a jaguar because they'd never seen anything human with blue eyes, there would be two pairs of black eyes staring down into my eyes from the house next door where two teenage boys had built themselves an observation platform. Everything I did was watched and scrutinized and commented upon and usually laughed about and often accompanied by sound effects. Comey and Kinda would be lying there waiting for that moment when I opened my eyes and they would make the first announcement of the day, which would be relayed around the clearing. Baro, nyanigamamba, which means she's awake. Well, I'm not going to take you moment by moment through the whole Alka day, but everything I did brought great hilarity. And my job, of course, was to try to learn this language. Well, if somebody says to you, Baro nyanigamamba, how much of that would you get down on paper? There wasn't any interpreter. There were no books. There was no alphabet. And so it was rather a laborious job to learn this language. And our object, of course, Rachel and my object, was to translate the Bible for them. And the good news is, parenthetically, that the New Testament has now been completed in the Waurani language. But finally, after the first year of struggles, I did know enough of the language to be able to ask questions and to understand most of what was said to me. So one day, I asked Ikita, who was the oldest man in the group, if he would come to my little house. And by that time, I was living in a house that had walls and floors and furniture. And would he please take the little plastic microphone of my very primitive little tape recorder and tell me a story which was of keenest interest to me, a story that I'd been wanting to hear for years, how Gikita and his other fellow Alcas had killed those five missionaries. Well, Gikita was delighted. They loved to tell stories about killings. And so he began by telling us how they had often watched big airplanes go over very high up in the sky, but then there was a little yellow ibu, as they called it. Well, ibu was the word for the wood bee, a kind of bee that makes makes a very loud buzzing and sounds very much like a small airplane, and how this little plane began to come and drop gifts to them. And he told me about the things that they received, things that they liked very much, beads and knives and mirrors and aluminum pots and axe heads and whatnot. And he said, we wondered why these strange white people in this plane were dropping these things to us, And some of us thought it was because they were friendly, and some of us thought it was because they were trying to catch us off guard. So he said, we really didn't know what to do when we realized one day that these men had made a camp on the edge of our territory. Now that, he said, produced a lot of arguments, and we sat around and talked about what we should do. This was serious. We believed that the white men were cannibals. Well, I said to Kikita, what made you think that? And he said, nothing, onongi, I really don't know where we got the idea, but we just thought that they were cannibals. And so, although some people said, no, they're really friendly, we should trust them, others said, no, they're coming to eat us. And so he said, one day, I and my friends went over to the Kurarai River, where we knew their camp was because we had been spying on them from back in the forest. They hadn't seen us, but we had seen them. And so, he said, we took our spears six men and four women. We men, he said, hid in the jungle, and we sent the four women out onto the beach to see what the men would do to them. Well, those white men didn't do anything to the women. They laughed and they talked and they gave them food. But he said, I finally said, I brought my spear, I'm going to use it. So I jumped out from my hiding place in the jungle, rushed into the river and sank the spear into the back of one of those missionaries. Probably your husband, he said. Well, I'm not sure it was my husband because he said, then another missionary came along and tackled me. And I've always kind of thought that maybe that was Jim because Jim did not believe in bearing arms and three of the five missionaries did have guns. And Jim was also a wrestler. So very likely Jim was the one who tackled Gikita when he speared one of the missionaries. But so began a fight that went on for a long time, which ended in the death of all five of those men. And of course, the question that we widows asked, 
was why. And in the epilogue of my book, The Savage, My Kinsman, I've said this. We must not proceed from our own notions of God's action. It often appears as though he has not acted. But we must look clearly and unflinchingly at what happens and seek to understand it through the revelation of God in Christ. His life on earth had a most inauspicious beginning. There was the scandal of the virgin birth, the humiliation of the stable, the announcement not to the village officials but to uncouth shepherds. A baby was born, a savior and king. But hundreds of babies were murdered because of his birth. His public ministry, surely no tour of triumph, no thundering success story, led not to stardom, but to crucifixion. Multitudes followed him, but most of them wanted what they could get out of him. And in the end, all his disciples fled. Yet out of this seeming weakness and failure, out of his very humbling to death, what exaltation and what glory. For the will of God is not a quantitative thing, static and measurable. The sovereign God moves in mysterious relation to the freedom of man's will. We can demand no instant reversals. Things must be worked out according to a divine design and timetable. The kingdom of God is like leaven and seed, things which work silently, secretly, slowly, but there is in them an incalculable transforming power, even in the plain soil, even in the dull dough, lies the possibility of transformation. For as the psalmist wrote, all things serve thee. That's from my book, The Savage, My Kinsman, which tells the story of living that first year with the Alka Indians. My daughter and I lived there for two years. A sovereign God in a broken world. We must trust him because he is love. And the older I get, the stronger becomes my faith that God knows exactly what he's doing and he's not finished with any of us yet. Just think what a wonderful ending the story is going to have. God bless you. Gateway to Joy 191, a recap of the Alka story from tragedy to triumph. Do you remember where you were the first time you heard about the five missionaries killed trying to reach out with the gospel? Well, Bob Lapine spent nearly three decades hosting Family Life Today, a nationally syndicated radio program. Bob, do you remember hearing about the five missionaries? You know, the story of what happened in January of 1956 when Jim Elliott and the other missionaries were martyred um, outside of Quito, Ecuador, that took place the, the same week I was born. And so the, the news that the account of what had happened was something I didn't learn until years later, early in my Christian life, when I heard about books like Through Gates of Splendor or The Shadow of the Almighty and Elizabeth stories of uh, the death of her husband, Jim Elliott, and how she rebounded from that. Um, and, and those were powerful stories. In fact, I remember asking her the first time we met about how she how she kept her her bearings when the news came back to her as a, a young mother with an infant, the news comes back that her husband and his friends have all been killed. And now here she is, a, a single parent living in Ecuador and wondering what's next for her. I, I asked her, how, do, how did you navigate that? And I've never forgotten. She said, it's easy to be overwhelmed by the, the immensity of all of that in the moment. She said, I learned there that the only thing I could do was to do the next thing. If I tried to look at everything, I would quickly sink. But if I just focused on doing the next right thing, that was what God would have me do. And I've shared that 
story and that advice with so many people, and it's guided me in my life. Anytime you become overwhelmed by circumstances, focus in on the next right thing to do and do that. Great wisdom from Elizabeth. Veteran radio host Bob Lapine. Thank you, Bob. Well, as you've thought about the loss of the five missionaries and their families, the Elliot, Udarian, McCauley, St. Fleming families, as well as Elizabeth's, is it hard to, to understand, really? Well, think about that with us today. Not just this one case, but throughout life, there are other times when we just don't understand. This is your friend, Elizabeth Elliot, talking on this Friday about something which may be very helpful to the mothers at home and the mothers who are not at home and to everybody else. It's about when I don't understand God's way, God's word, God's will. When we feel confused and baffled and just sort of stumbling around in the dark, not knowing which way to go or what to do. And perhaps I may be talking to someone today who's been just beginning to learn how to read the Bible alone and pray with no one to explain what the Bible means and no opportunity to go to a Bible class. I would certainly hope that everyone has the opportunity to go to church, but if you begin to read the Bible on your own and you've never done this before, you may find yourself uh, just floundering for a while. And so I have some things which have been a great help to me in trying to understand. In Mark 4.34, we read that when Jesus was alone with his disciples, he explained everything. He didn't explain everything to the multitudes. In fact, he often spoke in parables which could not be understood by the multitudes. And when he was alone with his disciples, that's when he explained things. It's very important for each one of us to spend time alone with God. You can rest assured that God knows the possibility and the impossibility of your being alone with him. Not every day is it possible for a mother to do that. I'm sure that no matter how faithful you may be in setting a special time aside and having a reasonable schedule for yourself, there certainly are times when you may be up most of the night with a sick child or you have a baby that is nursing erratically at different times. All kinds of things can happen to upset anybody's schedule, but I think especially the mothers of young children must be in a, in a very tender place in the Lord's heart because he knows he himself is the shepherd, and it says that he gently leads those that are with young. So don't worry about it if you're unable to have a time alone and quiet with the Lord. But I think with prayer for help and perhaps a little bit more organization of your time and the willingness to give up something that you yourself enjoy, you might be able to find 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 5 minutes, I don't know, but Sometime, just to get alone, you might have to go out into the garage and sit in the car. I don't know. Um, that lady whose letter I read this week that lives in 500 square feet with three children, I don't suppose it's very easy for her to find a place alone. But get down on your knees and ask the Lord to, to teach you whatever it was you read. Now, I have discovered three reasons why sometimes I don't understand something. The first is a question that I have to ask myself. Have I spent time alone with God? Sometimes I spend a lot of time reading devotional books, spiritual classics, and reading what somebody else has said about the Bible. And sometimes I skimp on reading the Bible myself. 
have I spent the time that I should spend alone with God, opening my heart and my ears, listening to him, which means in part opening his own word, the Bible. I don't really expect God to give me handwriting on the wall or to speak in an audible voice. I have to open the Bible and pray that the Holy Spirit who has been given us as a guide and a teacher and a comforter, pray that that Holy Spirit will enlighten me. I want to find out what God wants to say to me, just as Paul, Saul of Tarsus said when he fell down on the road to Damascus, he said, Lord, what do you want me to do? And then I pray for his instructions. A second reason is how much of what he might reveal to me would I be willing to obey? Are you like me wanting at times to just sort of skip over a passage real fast because there might be something there that hits me straight between the eyes? Have I already made up my mind that I will do anything, anything, he says? Well, not quite. I mean, I'd do almost anything, but there are some things he surely wouldn't ask me to do, we might say. Like my friend Lauren, who said she believed that she was 99% obedient. But the issue was revealed to her when the doctor told her that she must have an abortion. And she knew in her heart that a, an abortion would be wrong. And she said, it was then that I had to face my willingness or my unwillingness to go 100% of the way. Lauren was obedient. She refused to have an abortion. And the dire predictions that her child might either die or be seriously deformed didn't come true. Psalm 25, verse 14. The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. Isn't that lovely to think that the Lord confides in those who fear him? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. If you need wisdom, you need understanding. You need to begin with the fear of the Lord. And as George MacDonald has said, until we love, it is well that we should fear. Perfect love casts out fear, but none of us yet loves him perfectly. And so we need to fear him, not in the sense of being cowering and timid and afraid to approach him, but fear in the sense of awe and respect as we fear the awesome signs of nature, thunderstorms, volcanoes. God is more powerful than the biggest volcano, mightier than the breakers of the sea. But that second question, how much of what he might reveal would I be willing to obey? And the third question, am I doing today what I already know? Is it reasonable to expect further light if I haven't taken the first step in the portion of the pathway which God has already lighted for me. There may be some area of disobedience that God will reveal to me. And if your question still is, but how is he going to reveal this to me? I think very often it's a simple bringing something to your mind. I have that experience again and again. I forget something and I say, Lord, help me to remember. And it comes into my mind. Or I say the prayer of the psalmist, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. And he answers my prayer. Alexander McLaren, a great Scottish preacher of the 19th century, wrote this. No unwelcome tasks become any less unwelcome by putting them off till tomorrow. It is only when they are behind us and done that we begin to find that there is a sweetness to be tasted afterwards and that the remembrance of unwelcome duties unhesitatingly done 
is welcome and pleasant. Accomplished, they are full of blessing, and there's a smile on their faces as they leave us. Undone, they stand threatening and disturbing our tranquility and hindering our communion with God. If there be lying before you any bit of work from which you shrink, walk straight up to it and do it at once. The only way to get rid of it is to do it. Well, that, that describes one of my problems with confusion. So I will go over these three things again, things which have helped me when I don't understand, when I'm not sure about the will of God. First question I ask, have I spent time alone with him? Maybe I can find five minutes to get down on my knees and lift up my hands and open my heart to him. Second, how much of what he might reveal to me would I be willing to obey? At that point, I can say, Lord, I don't know what it's going to be, but I know you won't ask me to do anything for which you will not give me the grace. I know that you will help me. So yes, Lord, it is my will to do your will. And the third thing, am I doing today what I already know? It's not reasonable to expect God to show me something else if I haven't taken the first step in what God has already shown me. Let's pray. Father, thank you that you have promised to be our wonderful counselor. Show us your way, Lord, and help us to walk in it. For Jesus' sake, amen. Gateway to Joy Program 1000, When You Don't Understand. Well, as you think about the sacrifice of those five missionaries reaching out to the Alka or Waldani people, what do you think ultimately was the legacy of those five missionaries? Well, we'll hear from veteran Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger on what he thinks of their legacy. It has borne fruit, obviously, because there are, there are several uh, Alka people who are sincerely saved and wanting to live for the Lord. Now, at this conference that I attended in 2006, we got word from some of the older Alcas who were around when the men were killed that they're faithful, but they're concerned about the younger generation who they put into their language. They're not walking God's trail uh, like we did or we are doing. So they're concerned about the younger generation. Not really too different than any of us here in the United States wondering about the younger generation, our own children, grandchildren, etc. There are some, you know, good believers among them. As I noticed throughout the jungle, there's many among Quechua's and even the, the other uh, Shuar and not Shuar language groups, which is to the south. That's where Raja Udarian uh, was ministering. In all of these areas, there are groups of believers meeting together, uh, faithful to the Lord, and, uh, and all, I say, the, the various groups are local churches among them in all sizes and shapes of spiritual maturity. Most of these places are on their own now because there's no foreign missionaries in these places. Veteran Ecuadorian missionary Frank Kohlinger. Well, our time together has come to an end. Let me thank you for letting us come into your home, your office, maybe along with you as you took that jog, wherever we found you today. On behalf of the Elizabeth Elliott Foundation, in cooperation with the Bible Broadcasting Network, let me invite you to check out elizabethelliot.org for more lectures and talks, devotionals, videos, and more. It's elizabethelliot.org. And thanks for considering uh, leaving a review for us as well. Until next time, may God remind you daily that you're loved with an everlasting love and underneath are the everlasting arms. <laughs>